Um, last semester, the Ingrid Hoskins, who's the president of our history class, and I, I'm John Basler from the history department, we were thinking about doing an event about the refugee crisis um, in Syria because we think it's one of the great, great problems of our time and it does not get nearly enough attention in the American media and the attention that the refugees get here is often the wrong one. So we feel like it's our civic duty to inform ourselves and to talk about the situation that the people in Syria face. So we put together this panel to talk about different aspects of the crisis in Syria. And afterwards, we will also have occasion to talk with you, and you can ask us questions. So my suggestion for the procedure would be that we all first keep our relatively brief um, presentations. And then afterwards, you can ask questions about any of the presentations or any other topic you want to ask about. Um, I would also like to take the occasion to give a big thank you to the Saginaw Valley State Foundation that generally, uh, generously provided funding for this event. Um, so we really appreciate the support of the university as well. Yeah, uh, folks that are there, so don't worry what we're working on it. Just give us a little bit of time. So um, the way we'll proceed is first Ingrid Hoskins, the president of the History Club, will talk about the historical background of the nation of Syria. She'll give us a quick rundown of the history of Syria into the civil war that started in 2011. Then Dr. Rosina Hassoun, who teaches in the sociology department at SDSU, will talk about her research with refugees and also about the family background that she shares with refugees, because Dr. Soon has uh, refugees in her own family, so she can talk about her own experience. I'm John Basler. I teach in the history department. I will talk about the issues that um, Michigan and Europe face with refugees. And I'll talk a little bit about the responses in Michigan, and in particular, the responses in my home country of Germany towards the refugee crisis. Um, this is a lot of stuff that happened very recently, including some elections just this Sunday that I can address. And then lastly, we are delighted to have our main presenter, Dr. Mohamed Mahamami, who joins us from Wayne State University. Dr. Mahamami is from Syria. His hometown is Aleppo, which is one of the places that has been hit hardest by the Civil War. He also, as a medical doctor, is intimately familiar with the medical issues that the refugees in Syria and outside of Syria face. So he will talk about the issues of the refugees in the region. We have the map here. You have to notice that there are a lot of refugees in Syria. They are in Lebanon and in other neighboring countries. In addition to that, many of them have made it to Europe. And in addition to that, the United States has taken some refugees. And there are discussions right now in Congress how many more refugees the United States so after those presentations, then we will have a chance to have a more freewheeling discussion. So again, thank you all for coming. Um, we'll start with Ingrid Hoskins, and um, we'll proceed from there. So please um, welcome Ingrid Hoskins. Wow, we have a packed house tonight. We are working on chairs. They will be coming. <laughs> Some point, they will be here. So. I have the map up so everyone will have an introduction and kind of understand where I'm talking about in the world. But for centuries, Syria and the Middle East have been the center of conflict between outside powers. Syria fell to the Ottoman Turks in 1516 and remained a part of the Ottoman Empire for four centuries. During this period, Syria witnessed great deterioration in the economic, social, and political fields. By 1916, the Arabs took the opportunity of World War I to revolt against the Turkish rule. Arabs received British military help and promises that after the war ends, Arab countries would be granted their independence. After two years of conflict, Arab and British forces entered Damascus, ending the 400-year Ottoman, Ottoman occupation. In 1918, Syria was declared an independent kingdom, but France and Britain had their own agenda. By the sykes picot Agreement, the Middle East was divided between France and French and British spears have been put. Syria was placed under French mandate. Poorly equipped Syrian rebels were unable to fight against the French mandate of Syria. But Syrians resisted the invading forces and the French mandate. 
There were revolts and French bombings left Damascus in ruins. By 1936, the French accepted a, a partial Syrian independence as long as French troops remained on Syrian soil and could control under the French command. During World War II, Syria experienced several military confrontations between French troops loyal to the Vichy government and allied Germany, and the French troops, the three French troops who sided with Britain. They left Syria under British and French allied occupation, and the French promised to grant Syrian independence following the war. However, when the French failed to grant independence in 1945, and the French attack on the Syrian parliament in 1945, revolt began. The United Nations stepped United, sorry. The United Nations Security Council stepped in and forced the French withdrawal. Early years of Syrian independence were politically unstable. War broke out with the newly created state of Israel. The Arabs lost meant that the war forced Syria to sign an armistice agreement with Israel. A 1949 coup d'etat attempt led by Hassouni al Sisi and supported by the United States overthrew the national government. Following the next three leaders would be overthrown, the national government would be restored, and the country was left unstable. In 1958, Syria and Egypt merged to create the United Arab Republic, and in 1961, the UAR collapsed, and the Ba'ath Arab Socialist Party came to power in 1963. The Ba'athists dissolved the parliament and created a one-party regime. So in 1967, another war began with Israel, and that led to the anger and instability of Syria that will come to a head later on. Hafaz al-Assad, the, the then defense minister in 1970, led a movement that brought Syrian stability and security, but also one party and political repression. Assad was elected president in 1971 with the overwhelming majority of the people behind him. He led the nation ready to fight for his occupied land he mobilized political power and the Egyptian support, launched an attack against Israeli forces in the Golan Heights. The United States stepped in and called for the withdrawal of Israeli forces from any Arab ter territory. President Assad raised the flag over his liberated land on June 26, 1974. <coughs> Continuous conflict with the State of Israel led to conflicts of Arab solidarity, and so did Iraq's war in Iran in 1980. Syria believed the Islamic Revolution was the wrong war at the wrong time and with the wrong people. This led to the Gulf War and the Arab power of the Israeli conflict. One thing to note is that Assad represented the uh, white minority of Syria, so, and they were Shia Islam. Following the Gulf War and the end of the Cold War, Syria improved its relations with America and took part in peace talks on the Middle East. Syria vowed to sign along with Lebanon on the peace treaty, believing that with their support of Hezbollah and their resistance against the Israeli occupation, Lebanon would finally be free, and so would they. They successfully had a withdrawal of Israeli troops in 2000. In June 2000, President Assad died of a heart attack, and his son Bashar was elected in July. Bashar Assad's first order of business was to release 600 political prisoners, and by May 2001, Pope John Paul II visited in a historic visit. These two strategic moves made it appear that he was able to move the country forward. However, when the British Prime Minister Tony Blair arrived in November, President Assad and he could not agree on what terrorism could be defined. They, this grew Syrian tensions with the United States, who went on to continuous, a continuous mission to bring down Syria. So making the nation an axis of evil in 2002, threatening sanctions on the possible development of chemical weapons by 2003, and in 2004 placed economic sanctions over the nation because they supported terrorism, because they had failed to expel militants from Iraq. So by early 2005, tensions with America escalated between, because of Syrian influence over Lebanon. The United States pressed for Syrian withdrawal from Lebanon, and in April, President Assad in late 2006, an attack on the U.S. Embassy left three of the gunmen dead and one captured. President Assad worked to develop diplomatic relations with the United States. So by 2007, Nancy Pelosi was 
wealth on the of Damascus. This led to better tensions with America. However, in 2007, the enemy of North Korea and America were North, North Korea was accused of supporting Syrian nuclear sites. And so President Assad proceeded forward and began to open a dialogue with France and the French President Sarkozy in Paris. So by late 2008, Syria officially in more positive efforts, Syria moved towards a self-controlled economy with the help of America. Syrian pro-democracy writers were released from prison. U.S. special envoys were sent to discuss the Middle East. U.S. posted an ambassador in after a five-year break. Further progress was short-lived as sanctions once again were placed against Syria, and it was because of possible support for terrorism. Seeking weapons of mass destruction and proving and providing Hezbollah with weapons. So in March of 2011, security forces began to react against protesters in the south region of Dara. And people began to demand the release of political prisoners, leaving several persons dead. President Assad did comply and released dozens of the prisoners. However, in June, a hundred military security forces were killed and the government called the Syrian armed gangs, and troops besieged a northwest town, forcing them to cease first. The Syrian people began calling for, calling for dem democratic reforms as part of the civil uprising against the Ba'athist government. Upri the uprising emerged into a militant opposition movement, and elsewhere there was a revolution as well. In a matter of weeks, people in Tunisia and Egypt ousted the dictators who had ruled their countries for decades. No individual, group, or event was solely responsible for these historic movements, but it helped bring the people together who had for so long felt the governments and industries to revolt. And this tonight, like yesterday, marks the fifth year anniversary of the revolution in Syria. So um, I will shift focus now from the crisis in Syria, and I will talk about the impact of the crisis in Syria on the West. And I want to show that Syria also shows a crisis within us, the West, um, a political, economic, but I would argue tonight a spiritual crisis. Um, many Westerners, including frightened citizens, politicians, but also our supposedly best and bright thinkers, have been using the refugees as not as moral subjects, not as individuals to be treated worthy of, a, of consideration as ends in themselves, but as a means and occasion to censure whatever it is that we dislike about our own society. Paradoxically, our Western society is based on the idea of the value of the individual. That is the proud heritage of the Enlightenment that carried over after numerous disastrous setbacks, such as imperialism, two world wars, and the Holocaust, into the UN Declaration of Human Rights of 1948. The UN Declaration states in part, and I quote now, whereas recognition of the inherent dignity of the, uh, on, and of the equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family is the foundation of freedom, justice, and peace in the world, Whereas the peoples of the United Nations have in the Charter reaffirmed their faith in the fundamental human rights, in the dignity and worth of the human person, and in the equal rights of men and women, and have determined to promote so, um, social progress and better standards of life in larger freedom, everyone has the right to seek and to enjoy in other countries asylum from prosecution. We all know that the nations of the Western world have hardly lived up to these, our own high standards, but the crisis in Syria confronts us urgently with our failure. In Michigan, after the terrorist attacks in Paris on November 13, 2015, Michigan State Representative Gary Glenn said, and I quote, we should not rush to offer an open door to the high-risk importation of individuals from a known hotbed of Islamic extremism. Shortly afterwards, the Associated Press reported that on November 16, 2005, I quote the Associated Press, Governor Snyder said in a statement that the state is postponing efforts to accept refugees until federal officials fully review security clearances and procedures 
He added that Michigan's first priority is protecting the safety of our residents. Soon dozens of governors followed this example and asked the Department of Homeland Security for a full review of screening procedures. This was despite of the fact that the United States already has a rigorous screening process for refugees, one that typically takes 18 to 24 months. It includes comprehensive background checks of all applicants conducted by the FBI, the Department of Homeland Security, and the Department of Defense. Since October 2015, the United States has accepted about 2,000 Syrian refugees. Of those, about 200 have come to Michigan and joined the roughly 3,000 Syrian Americans in the greater Detroit area. On January 26, 2016, the Michigan State Senate debated a non-binding, in other words, showboating resolution sponsored by Senator Patrick Kohlbeck, a Republican of Canton, that urged Governor Rick Snyder to continue his position of pausing the program of resettling Syrian refugees fleeing their country into Michigan. The debate ended without a vote, but Governor Snyder's policy of not admitting additional Syrian refugees still stands. By letting our fears win over our ideals, many Michiganders are not living up to the values we claim as the values of Western civilization. In Europe, the plight of the people of Syria has also exposed the limits of what we, as Westerners are willing to live up to. In fact, the Euro, the EU, the European Union, is currently facing an existential crisis, not caused by the refugees, but by the stubborn failure of the European countries to face the crisis in a united fashion. According to estimates by the UN Refugee Agency and the International Organization for Migration, between January 1st and December 21st, 2015, some 972,000 refugees have crossed the Mediterranean Sea, according to UN figures. In addition, there's there are estimates that over 34,000 have crossed from Turkey into Bulgaria and Greece by land, but 4,000 in this time were reported missing or drowned. Roughly half of these refugees were from Syria, yet the European Union has so far failed to create a coordinated response to deal with the people arriving. Proposals for a quota system for distributing refugees among member countries of the EU has met determined resistance, particularly among the new members of the EU from Central Europe. While the United Kingdom so far has only welcomed about 1,000 refugees and has pledged to take 20,000 more by the year 2020, France has promised to take 30,000 asylum seekers by the end of 2017. Although um, President Hollande lately has been kind of a uh, going back on that. In Germany, on the other hand, 442,000 people have requested asylum in 2015. There are probably many more who are refugees, but they haven't registered yet as asylum seekers, so we don't know the whole number. But we may assume that it's about twice the number, so about 442,000 people requested asylum in Germany, probably 800,000 people arrived in 2015. About one third of these requests were made by Syrians. Almost all of them will be eventually accepted. On Monday, March 7, the European Union held an emergency meeting in Brussels with Turkey, in which European leaders desperately begged the increasingly authoritarian regime of President Erdogan, which just last week violently seized control of the opposition newspaper Zaman, and has incarcerated journalists who have reported on the Turkish government's war against the Kurdish resistance against ISIS, to take the Syrian refugees off our hands. In the summit, EU ministers promised Turkish Prime Minister Davoglu about $6.6 .6 billion over three years, twice the amount initially offered, to keep the refugees out of Europe. In exchange for the additional funds, Ankara was willing to take back migrants coming from Turkey from a set date who were denied asylum, as well as those intercepted in its territorial waters, diplomats told Reuters news agency. EU leaders are also reportedly considering a request to take one Syrian refugee directly from Turkey for each one Turkey takes back from Greece. So kind of a swap of uh, refugees is another part of this agreement between the EU and Turkey. In addition to money, Turkey demands a reboot of the stalled negotiations for EU membership and visa-free travel for its citizens to the EU. Nick Dearden, uh, director of the international social justice organization Global Justice Now, said, and I quote, it's obscene that one of the richest parts of the world, which continues to grow wealthy from the resources of other countries, is contracting out, is contracting out its human rights duties to poorer countries. 
The militarization of the Mediterranean Sea is one more aspect of the creation of a gated community for the richest part of the world, Bearden said. A further advantage of outsourcing the refugee crisis to Turkey is that Western cameras will be less likely to capture images of refugees in the increasingly authoritarian Turkey of President Erdogan. In Germany, the arrival of large numbers of refugees has created a violent backlash, in particular in the former East and the state of Saxony. In 2015, 528 attacks on refugee accommodations took place. 126 of these attacks were arson. In addition, the NGO Pro Asyl counted 126 physical attacks against refugees in Germany in 2015. Overall, this is a quadrupling of cases in comparison to the year before. The police only solved roughly 25% of those crimes. Further, in 2015, anti-refugee groups staged 283 public demonstrations against refugees. There are many reasons for this increasing violence. Among them is the lack of financial support for cities and towns to host and integrate the new arrivals. Without the tireless work of volunteers, many of them retired teachers, these efforts would have failed already. Some violent incidents involving young men who attacked German women, most prominently in Cologne on New Year's Eve, created a shift in the public perception of refugees. But there's also an increasing nationalist agitation to protect our country against foreigners. In my hometown of Bensheim, the right-wing populist party Alternative for Germany achieved 17.4% of the vote in the local elections last Sunday became the third strongest party in my state, the home, my home state, the state of Hessen. In three state elections just three days ago, the alternative for Germany achieved between 15 and 25% of the vote. In the state of Saxony, in which foreigners only make up 2% of the population, long nurtured fears of economic and cultural marginalization make themselves heard in anti-refugee protests. Calls to make Europe less attractive to refugees in other words, to purposefully worsen the plight of people fleeing for their lives makes a mockery of the idea of Western Enlightenment values. These developments in Michigan and in my home country of Germany are shameful, outrageous, and worrying. They show a failure of the Western imagination. What I'm talking about here is a failure of what we call democratic interventionalism, which assumes that the West has the right to rouse violent insurrections around the world against dictators. But what gives the West the legitimacy to expose <coughs> millions of people to death and misery for our own political ends? As early as March 2012, the President Obama's legal advisor, Harold Coe, applauded the weapons deliveries from the Arab League to the rebel groups in Syria. In March 2013, the New York Times reported over 160 flights with weapons from Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Jordan, to the Turkish airport of Essen Bogar, and from there across the border, all with logistical support from the CIA. At this time, the Obama administration still publicly claimed that it only provided non-lethal aid to the rebels. This changed in June 2013, when the United States officially announced military aid and training for Syrian rebels. On October 8, 2015, President Obama announced the end of America's official $500 million aid program, but covert assistance continues. The main culprit in the Syrian civil war is the Assad regime. But according to former United Nations Special Envoy Lakhda Brahimi, the civil war might have ended in 2012 if the West had not ignored Russia's offer to negotiate a phase process of stepping down of President Assad. But as early as July 2011, Western leaders demanded President Assad's resignation as the first demand before negotiation. In other words, the West wanted Assad out not to end the civil war. The United States, like every outside power engaged in Syria, is looking out for its own interests. In game theory terms, that is a classic collective action problem. The collective action problem is when everybody pursues their own maximum gains nobody ends up achieving the maximal possible gains. In simple terms, that means we have to learn to recognize respect for each other's point of view and each other's interests. The second illusion that I want to highlight is the failure to see refugees as individual human beings. Instead, we treat them as bureaucratic abstractions, 
in need of quotas, humanized masses and floods of material, as dangerous others who bring terror to our shores. As sociologist Benjamin Baba already warned in 1993, the flip side of Mac World, the interconnected global consumer society, is jihad, a return to tribalism, the retreat into a thinking of inside and outside my group. We in the secular Christian West like to think that jihad is something only others, particularly Muslims, engage in, but that is a failure of the imagination as well. Donald Trump is talking in terms of jihad and is amassing support around the country here, as are populists in Poland, Hungary, France, Austria, Germany, and elsewhere in Europe. The people of Syria therefore pose a challenge for the West, a challenge to see the common humanity between all of us and therefore rediscover our values and the better angel of the country. John, that feeds well into what I plan to do here. Let me flip the platform up for just a second. So um, basically, I'm trying to put a human face on um, the issue of refugees and stories, um, looking at multi-generational traumas, unrequited loss, multiple recoveries, as a researcher and also as the daughter and granddaughter of refugees. So I will talk in, in briefly um, about my experiences with being children, about my experiences with professional refugees, professionals who work with refugees. And I'm going to use my study, I'm going to use a case study because I know it more intimately than any other group of refugees. And so then I'll talk about recovery. Um, first of all, I am engaged currently in a research project looking at refugee women's access to health care. And so I have three um, SBSU students who are interviewing Syrian refugees and preparing for that research. So we don't have data yet, we will have. Imagine being dumped in a foreign country, because refugees don't usually get to choose on where they end up. You don't speak the language, you don't know how to get a doctor, you don't know how to get insurance, you don't know how to access the health insurance plan for the health system itself. So these are the questions that we need to address in our research. Um, while I was working on my doctoral dissertation in the 1990s in, in Dearborn, the Metropolitan Detroit area, um, I actually supported myself by running, by running an after-school program for children um, with learning disabilities at the Arab Community Center for Economic and Social Services Access in Dearborn. I had 40 kids in my after-school program, and many of them were victims of war. The children had ADHD, hyperactivity, physical, di uh, physical um, um, disabilities, emotional disabilities, and they all were trying to learn English, so they had English acquisition problems as well. So in my program, I remember most distinctly one little boy who was a Yemeni victim of war. This little boy had been living in a village, and there, during the fight in the Civil War, the villagers had armed themselves, and his father had weapons in the house. The little boy picked up a rifle, his father's rifle, and accidentally shot his own father. Um, his father did not die, but he was severely crippled. So every time that little boy looked at his father, there was overwhelming guilt. His father forgave him long ago, but the child could not forgive himself. Um, he was an emotion. He was nine year old, but emotionally a six year old. Um, he had pinch and deficit disorders. He had um, emotional outbursts. He was violent at times. He was emotionally needy all the time. He needed constant attention. And um, we tried medication. We had counselors. We tried everything. I mean, try to explain to a child who is emotionally six years old what a flashback is and what they're experiencing. They don't get that. He was the most severe case. Of the Yemeni children I had, also little girls who had gone to the war, they were withdrawn, they were quiet, and they were depressed. And so to get them to even engage was a problem. So I've seen the pain of what happens to children who are victims of war firsthand. At the same time in Dearborn, we had tens of thousands of Iraqi refugee children who were in our Dearborn schools. Um, many of them had been in refugee, camp, refugee camps at least a decade, some of them, um, in Turkey and in Saudi Arabia. In Saudi Arabia, there were not many outside NGOs that came to help, so there was no education for the kids. And then we had 11, 12, and 13 year old children who had never held a pencil in their hand. They had no fine motor skills, but they had never developed them. They couldn't read or write, and they were six or seven years behind in school. These are the real problems that refugee children face. 
Um, in Cleveland, I did another like an interview of 350 contacts for dissertation with Dearborn. In Cleveland, we did a participatory action research project where there were another 300 people. And in, in the process of engaging with that project, we were looking for needy um, Arab women, and the most needy of all of them, the ones that needed um, more services, were women who had lost their husbands, either divorced or, or basically more. And so some of them were refugees and some were immigrants. What I realized is they had told me, they told me firsthand stories of what happens with camps when you're a refugee woman and facing rape and facing uh, violence in camps. But they got to the United States, and what the United States does with our refugees is we give them two years of welfare. In that time, you're supposed to learn a new language, you're supposed to get a job, and you're supposed to be able to support yourself. Here I had women. Women's education is the most fragile, is what gets damaged first. If a family has only a little bit of money for education, the boys are going to be educated so they can um, support themselves. So I had women with less than grade school educations. They didn't speak English. Um, many of them wore hijab, and so we saw also discrimination. They were making beds in hotels at midnight. Um, shifts when they couldn't find anyone to take care of their children. So this, they were still vulnerable. Even after getting out of the war, out of the war situation, their recovery is going to be very, very long, probably multiple generations in order to recover. But you think, okay, well, that's the poorest of the poor and the most vulnerable. Um, shouldn't the doctors, the lawyers, the engineers, when they're ref made refugees, they've got more resources, they come to America, won't they do fine? Well, that's not what I found. Um, over and over again. In Europe, um, European countries, most of them have recertification programs for engineers, doctors, lawyers. They want that expertise in their countries. America gives them the same two years. You know, learn English. It takes three to five years for a child to learn English. Um, you can imagine, and these are professionals, some of them have learned English, fortunately, but tell them to go to get learn the language, go back to med school, or go back to college and re and, and relearn everything that you have that you would learn get recertified as an engineer or a doctor or a lawyer, and do all that in two years and support your family at the same time. What do we have? We have doctors and lawyers and engineers um, who are refugees and immigrants coming to America, and they're driving ca taxi cabs. You know, one of the stories that touched my heart um, uh, so deeply, I will never forget, the Iraqi physician, refugee woman who lost her husband in war, she had um, three little children to support. Um, she said, my whole life, I wanted to be a pediatrician. A children's doctor was all I dreamed of when I was growing up, was what I wanted to do. I made it. I, I was a doctor. I was helping children. And then I became a refugee. And then she would say, I, I will never be a doctor again. And the tears would just automatically fall down from the sides of her face. Um, she's translating in a hospital for real kids. We lost an amazing pediatrician. So this is some of the things that happened. My switching to my own family story. This is my family um, picture of my um, family members, circa 1900. Um, my great grandfather was a Protestant minister from Iraq, from the northern area of Iraq. Um, he was also the head of our family's caravan business. Um, he married a woman from Homs, Syria. That's Ms. Malani, the sister of a very famous scholar, Ibrahim Malani. She was educated. These are her grown children. And Paulina over there is a very famous feminist of the early 1900s. Well dressed, well educated women, as well as the men in my family. Um, you can see my family was doing well in 1900, and they had moved from Iraq to Palestine, and they were doing quite well. They were in this is the house they lived in. This is a picture taken later on after the war, the house that started off with the marriage. That little picture up in the corner, up the top, in the middle of that picture of the back, is my father. It's the only picture that survived when my dad is born. My father came to America with a small package of a little envelope, white envelope of pictures. That's all we had. The pictures you previously saw, I never had seen my great grandparents until uh, an uncle died in our uh, Actually, he's a cousin of a cousin, died, and he sent us the pictures. I mean, it was a joy to get back the pictures and the, all of the history. Our refugees, one of the things they first lose is all of those, all of those pictures, all of your memorabilia, including your health records and your, and your school records and everything else is all gone. So that's the only picture of my dad as a boy. And all those people lived in that house. So it was a, it was a house that was my grandfather is an interesting story of what happens to, to, to um, refugees as well. My grandfather was the mayor of the city of Acre, and his story is a story of unrequited loss for the city. He was the mayor of a beautiful city in Acre. He loved the city. He loved that city. Everybody knew him in the Acre and Haifa area. When he, when he was older and he was retired, he'd walk around the city and say, oh, Mr. Mayor. He sat at a, if he sat down at a restaurant, people would gather. He 
always had someone with him. He came to America when he was a nobody. He lost his country, he lost his home. There was this unrequited loss. I talked to Native Americans. They understand the unrequited loss. It's lost in him. And so he had that and a loss of personal person of, of idea, personal identity. And so my grandfather suffered from, from permanent depression. And so that depression was very common among refugees. My father was the owner of a restaurant. Um, he was a master chef. Um, he was district controller of the gallery. He was a British officer during the Second World War, secretary of the Congress of FIFA, and he worked for the International Red Cross all before the age at, before the age of 21 when he came to America. Pretty successful young man, but perhaps was damaged. And so um, in 19, right before 1948, before the war in 1947, my father decided that the big house in Acre was too big for my grandparents. They couldn't take care of it. So he basically said, let's move you to Wadiness House, which is in the area of Haifa. Let's move you there, nice house. It had a little um, orange trees in the backyard. My grandfather was happy. It had roses in the front yard. My grandmother was really happy with the roses. And then six months later, a huge war just happens, you know? And so on the 9th of April 21st, 1948, um, the Haganah fire and mortar shell landed on the street. Oops, excuse me. Don't use your hand. Okay. Um, they basically landed in the street in front of the house and they ran for their lives. My family was fortunate. They still had the old house. It was empty. There was no furniture in it, nothing. But they ran in the middle of the night and tried to get carried back to the house in Acre. Um, I want to tell you some stories also of some of the other members of my family because they relate to the Syrian also, the issue of multiple traumas and multiple displacements. My family was displaced first in 1948 to the old house. They were able to rebuild. Some of my other friends, for example, I'm living, um, she was born under a tree in the West Bank, an olive tree, when her family ran for their lives, and her mother died in childhood family. So I feel that my family was extremely fortunate to have been displaced someplace. Um, the other thing that happens by 1959, we have lost the old house, and the Israelis um, have turned School of Michigan. Um, so all my family's uh, members were made refugees by 1959. Um, particularly when we're talking about my, my aunt, she's my father's first cousin. Um, our family, um, they had a beautiful house in Jerusalem prior to 1948. The 1948 uh, war, they took the house. Um, Golden Meyer actually lived in that house. The Israelis <laughs> took that. Okay. So then my, my grandfather had some land in the West Bank and he gave the family the West the land and the family pulled all of their money and they built the house for him. West Bank. By 1967, she's a window, widow with five children, most of them grown. And guess what happens? The 67 war comes, they lose the house. She runs for her life a second time. She runs to Beirut. She gets to Beirut, 1982, the war, the bombing of Lebanon by Israel. During the lull of the fighting, she goes out to find food. She comes back, and the apartment building is gone. Three times a refugee in one lifetime. The Palestinians were the largest refugee population on earth up until the um, Iraq and Syria conflicts. Many of them fled to Syria and they fled to Iraq, and now they're refugees a second time. So they're part of the refugee problem today. Um, so these are just some of the issues that are, are happening. My family would not be happy if I showed you this picture. I put my father's past, everyone has passed, would object. But this is my grandparents when they arrived. Gone are the nice clothes, they're practically wearing rags. Very small house. I remember going hungry at night. My father drove crazy. He was he had his first one of his first jobs in El Paso where he lived was actually selling cars on commission. 